Hey, I'm Trey. Today's story is about a killer who was sexually aroused with the sight of blood. If you enjoy more stories such as these, I upload new content every Tuesday and Thursday. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section. Well, if you're ready, let's get started. October 1969 in the country of Canada and in the city of Ontario, which is known to be populated by millions, would now become the stomping ground for a new and improved type of killer. A woman who lived in the area of the apartment complex in the downtown area was known to her neighbors as a quiet but kind person who mainly kept to herself and lived alone. A neighbor went to the back of the complex for an unspecified reason and observed a woman laid out on the ground, fully clothed, allegedly with her eyes open. The neighbor assumed that the woman had a medical emergency, such as a heart attack or a stroke, and rushed to call for help. The authorities were notified and responded. When the medical services and police arrived, it was obvious that the woman had been dead for some time. The victim was identified as Shirley Audet. The police quickly realized that the woman died of strangulation due to the marks left around her neck. An autopsy was completed on the woman and it was also determined that she had been sexually assaulted. It was believed that the killer, before murdering the woman, left deep bite marks on her breasts. The bite marks were pronounced enough that the wound seemed like the killer was attempting to remove a chunk of flesh. Another thing that baffled the authorities was that she had no defensive wounds. What the police would typically do in this situation is to see if they can locate any scrapings of skin from the attacker underneath the victim's fingernails. There were no traces of skin found. This led the police to believe that the victim must have known and trusted the attacker. One of Audrey's previous boyfriends, when questioned by the authorities, stated that after they had ended their relationship on good terms, mind you, she met another young attractive man that she was very interested in. She also mentioned through their casual conversation that this new man seemed to be into being extremely dominant and rough during sexual intercourse. The ex-boyfriend stated that he believed that she would not have mentioned this to him if she was not concerned about this new guy's sexual practices. That ex-boyfriend specifically felt that she was getting into something dangerous. The ex-boyfriend was unable to provide the authorities with a name for the guy that Audrey was talking about when they discussed the new boyfriend. At the same time, Audrey did have a current boyfriend who was at work during the time of her murder and the authorities verified this. The police had no evidence or witnesses available at this time. The following month of November, a woman by the name of Marielle Archambault, who was a jewelry store clerk, just finished work. She was a hard-working woman who took her job seriously and showed up for work regularly rain or shine. It was alleged that she was not seen often smiling, but this particular day, Marielle had been observed by her colleagues with a glow about her similar to a happy young schoolgirl. Before she left work that day, she was seen with a new male friend of hers that she was becoming extremely fond of. Marielle seemed very happy to see this new strange man meet her there at her job and then leave together. The following day, Marielle had not shown up for work to assist with the setting the business arrangements up. No one received any calls from Marielle stating that she would be late or absent from work that day, so this made all of her co-workers concerned. That day, the manager, whose name was not provided, decided to check on Marielle at her apartment in order to see if she was okay and question her about what happened. When the manager arrived and knocked on the door, no one answered. And he checked the door and the door was locked. Something didn't sit right with the manager about her not coming to work and not calling to let her manager know that she would not make it into work that day. Because the manager felt more like a friend than a coworker, he became even more worried. This caused him to seek out the landlady, who was the person that would have access to the apartment's master key, to find out what happened to his friend. After he located and explained the situation to the landlady, he was able to convince her to unlock Marielle's door so they could check on her together. They unlocked the door and entered. Initially, when they first walked into the apartment, everything seemed in order. But when they went into the living room, it told an entirely different story. To their surprise, Marielle was found murdered. 
She was completely naked and laying across her sofa. The pantyhose and bra that she wore were ripped into shreds and flung across the floor. They both immediately backed out of the apartment in order to not contaminate the obvious crime scene. The police were notified and responded. After closer inspection, the victim was found to have deep bite marks and tear marks on both of her breasts which poured a lot of blood onto the floor post-mortem. An autopsy was done and it was found that Marielle had also been raped by the killer. As the police sorted through the crime scene looking for evidence, they came across a photograph. That photograph was shown to several of Marielle's co-workers, but at the time, none of them could confirm or deny if this was the same person seen with Marielle. It was probably because none of them had really had gotten a good look at the unknown handsome man. The authorities were eventually able to identify the unidentified man in the photograph. That man actually turned out to be Marielle's father, who was young at the time, but now deceased. The police were now at a dead end and the case remained unsolved at that time. The public was made aware that a rapist killer roamed their city streets. The media named the killer the Vampire Rapist. During the month of January 1970, a man by the name of Brian Caulfield went to meet his girlfriend by the name of Jean Way at her residence. They had a date planned and he was supposed to pick her up. When he got to the residence, he knocked on the door and no one answered. He tried the door handle and found that it was locked. Believing that he came a little too soon, or she may have stepped out for a minute, he decided to leave and come back a short time later. When he did return, he knocked on the door and still no one answered. He then tried the door handle and this time the door was unlocked. Brian entered and found his girlfriend completely naked and lying on the bed. Jean was unresponsive to his cries, so he assumed something was wrong and immediately contacted the authorities. A preliminary investigation was done and it was determined that Jean had struggled with her killer. Several fibers were found under her fingernails that must have belonged to the murderer. It was also believed that when Brian arrived and knocked at the door, the killer was inside the apartment and became startled. This may have also prevented her body from being completely brutalized like the prior victims were. When the media found out that there were now three killings, likely from the same serial killer, the entire city went into a panic mode. Since there was so much media attention, the killing subsided for some time, and this allowed the citizens to drop their guard for some time. Question: What made these people think that the serial killer would just manifest a conscience and then retire? 1971, a school teacher by the name of Elizabeth Portus was home alone that evening after returning from work. The following day, she had not shown up for her job. The school became concerned she had not contacted them. Because Elizabeth was dedicated to her job, she barely missed any days off. The school officials contacted the apartment manager requesting that a well-being check be done for Elizabeth at her apartment. The manager of the apartment complex was contacted and notified of the situation. The manager went to Elizabeth's apartment, entered using the master keys, and Elizabeth's body was immediately found naked on her bedroom floor. The bedroom looked completely destroyed due to a fierce struggle between herself and the actor. The authorities arrived and found that Elizabeth had been raped and strangled to death. That killer mutilated both of her breasts by biting chunks of flesh off of each. During the search of the crime scene, a man's broken cufflink was found on the floor. Witnesses notified the police that they saw her the night before with a handsome young man operating a blue Mercedes-Benz vehicle. The vehicle had a unique bull-shaped decal on the rear window. You gotta be kidding me. This fool should be easy to find driving around with an emblem like the Batman symbol on his car. Another friend of Elizabeth's told her that she would be meeting a man by the name of Bill that was a flashy dresser and drove an expensive car. The information that was provided by the witnesses was disseminated throughout the local news. In May of the same year, a blue Mercedes-Benz was spotted parked by a police officer on patrol near one of the previous murder scenes. Something caught this officer's attention that made him believe that something was familiar about this particular vehicle. The officer then recalled the information provided to the public about the possible actor involved in the recent string of rapes and homicides possibly operating a similar vehicle. The officer waited for the operator to return to the vehicle. After about 30 minutes of waiting, a man approached the car and then entered. The police officer arrested the owner.
The man was identified as Wayne Bowden, and he happened to be an ex-fashion model. I'm sorry, I just have to say now that this was good damn police work. During the interview, Wayne acknowledged previously dating Elizabeth Porters. She just so happened to be the most recent murder victim. The police were able to link the cufflink found at her residence during the evening of her death to Wayne. The police located a local orthodontist along with the help of the United States FBI. They were able to construct a strong enough case to identify Wayne as the perpetrator for all the victims. They were able to match his bite characteristics with the imprints left on the mutilated women's breasts. Although Wayne denied responsibility for all of the homicides, he was charged, found guilty, and given a life sentence in prison. In 2006, Wayne Bowden died of skin cancer in prison. If you enjoy more stories such as these, click on one of the suggested videos above. Also, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and notification button so you can be reminded of new content that I upload every Tuesday and Thursday. God bless and stay safe.